Hey, okay, this video isn't going to tell you which sample libraries to go out and buy. I'm gonna give you something way more powerful than that. What I am going to share with you is how professional film, TV, and games composers decide upon which sample libraries to buy, and perhaps more interestingly, the strategy production music composers use to make thousands of dollars off the back of buying a sample library that might have only cost them a hundred dollars or so. Plus, I'm going to share a quote where Hans Zimmer talks about carrots. Seriously. For great insider tips on writing production music for music libraries, TV, film, and games, subscribe to the Music for Income channel and hit the bell to be notified when we post a new video each week. I'm Michael from Music for Income. I'm a professional TV composer and I also run a production music library. If you want an intro to that world, check out this video above where I'll walk you through everything you need to know to get started. So, sample libraries. Like many professional composers, I'm actually not a huge fan of buying every sample library under the sun. I know you see huge templates in YouTube videos with people who score film and TV, but that is more often that we we've refined our go-to choices on a micro level. For example, I might love my pizzicato strings from one library, I might like the short and dry strings from another library, and the big, soft, warm strings from a third library. It's more about knowing what each sample library you buy does and doesn't do well. So yes, keep your samples relevant and of the highest quality you can afford, but you're often at much more of an advantage becoming a master of what you have and manipulating those sounds. If you're considering a new sample library purchase, run it past these rules. They are pretty simple. Number one, do I or will I definitely use these kinds of sounds in my tracks? And then move on to ask number two, do I already have something that does this and does it well enough? If you'll definitely use them and you don't have anything that already does this well enough, only then should you consider buying it. Here's the next point with buying sample libraries and it's hugely important. Aim to sound different to everyone else. If you're constantly buying the sounds that everyone else is buying, you're just gonna sound more and more like everyone else. Sounding like all the other submissions that a music library gets isn't going to do you any favors when pitching tracks to them or when trying to pitch to be the composer for a new film, TV series, or video game. You want to be moving away from the presets. What that means for most of us is that you want to be drilling down into the sounds that you have and finding new and interesting ways to approach them. Go spend a little more time creating interesting sounds and the compositions often come easier as they get led by these sounds. Check out this quote from Hans Zimmer. He says, it's like I'm a chef. The first thing you do is go, what is fresh and what are my ingredients? And I spend forever peeling potatoes and carrots, but I know the guests are turning up at 8 p.m. and at 7.50 p.m. I throw it all in the pot. But the amount of potato peeling and carrot chopping and crying over the onions that I do far outstrips the other time. What Hans is talking about here is creating sounds, textures, and all sorts of sonic goodies that will serve as the DNA of the music that he puts together just before the guests arrive. If you want to stand out from the crowd, take the time to get the DNA of your track sounding different from everyone else who is using the same sample packs. This is why so many top composers go out and sample things themselves. It's about making things different and interesting. Now, there is, however, an exception to this rule. It's a lucrative strategy that many top library music composers use to make some really good money in a short space of time. 
So as I mentioned in the intro, this video is not a list of which sample packs and sample libraries to buy. That list may change every few months and will certainly be different for every composer. This strategy is about being able to identify yourself what and when to buy to accelerate your licensing income, a formula you can apply for years to come. What I'm gonna share with you is a technique that I see used over and over and over again by high-end library music composers. Having spoken to lots of these folks, let me share with you what they do. First rule, they keep their ear to the ground on new sample packs. So keep signed up to sample company emails and have a scroll through new product demo videos and walkthroughs when you're notified about them. What these composers are looking for is something that captures the zeitgeist of a TV or film genre in a new or interesting way and or captures a fresh angle or sound within that. Again, that style must be heard currently on film and TV. There is no point trying to license tracks that aren't used within film and TV for that purpose. Now, some of these sample packs or sample libraries might be ones that are inspired by the approach of a groundbreaking new soundtrack specifically, or a new way of approaching an instrument that has been made popular recently. And by the way, if you have ever been inspired by a groundbreaking soundtrack approach, composer or instrument that was used in a really new and interesting way, drop that link in the comments. Now, back to it. Once they find something like this, a sample pack or sample library that really captures this new approach, they buy it fast, i.e. as close to release as possible. And then, and here's the important part, they write as many quality tracks with it as fast as they can and get those to great libraries as fast as they can. They want their tracks using those samples within this relevant genre to be contracted by a music library. They want to get to that music library before it gets flooded with everyone else who's bought that same sample pack and created similar tracks with it. See, that's how it goes with music libraries. The challenge is largely about finding an angle and a sound to get them interested as much as being able to write in a certain style. I'm sure you could write tracks as good as some of the ones a library already have, but if they're over-serviced in a genre, if someone got there first, you're basically gonna have to find another library to pitch those tracks to. Obviously, only do this for samples in a genre that you are confident in writing in. To close out, I'm gonna show you an interesting screenshot. It's from a Facebook thread of composers talking about a new sample pack that just came on the market. It proves my point about composers jumping on innovative or fresh sounding sample packs and getting tracks out there with them Fast. I've covered over names for privacy, but the person whose name is masked out in blue is a very well-regarded composer. And the person masked out in green is a multi-award winning TV composer. The thread written about this new sample library starts with one composer saying, damn, too many people are buying this now. Our other composer replies, I know, right? I already released four trailer albums based around these patches, got a strike while the iron's hot. And our multi-award winning TV composer then says, I scored three TV series already, out next week, gotta beat the wave. So this strategy is obviously way more about making money from exploiting a sample pack or sample library than aiming for long-term artistic gain, but it's a great way to get generating some income from your music. So if you wanna take advantage of this approach, then when you find a sample pack that one, sounds new and fresh, and two, is of a style that it's popular and current on TV and film, jump on it and write and send out tracks fast. Now, obviously, there's more to it than just having the sounds. You need to write tracks in a way that is a 
that are appealing to production music libraries. So they'll sign your tracks over the competition. Plus, if you really know how to structure your music, you'll win over those all important TV editors who are the ones selecting the tracks from the music libraries and putting them onto the TV shows. I interviewed some award-winning editors about what kinds of things composers should do when writing music for film and TV, along with some things they should never do. And I want to give you three free lessons from my research. And these are tips you can use in your music immediately. So just click on the link in the description below and grab those three free lessons. I hope you found this video useful. If so, hit like and subscribe, plus hit that bell to get notified of our new videos as they come out. Also, check out the other videos on the Music for Income channel that I think you'll really enjoy. Thanks so much for joining me and I'll catch you next time around.